Preface and Chapter 1 of Memoir of Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lori Heinrichs. Memoir of Jane Austen by James Edward Austen Lee. Preface. The memoir of my aunt Jane Austen has been received with more favor than I had ventured to expect. The notices taken of it in the periodical press, as well as letters addressed to me by many with whom I am not personally acquainted, show that an unabated interest is still taken in every particular that can be told about her. I am thus encouraged not only to offer a second edition of the memoir, but also to enlarge it with some additional matter which I might have scrupled to intrude on the public if they had not thus seemed to call for it. In the present edition the narrative is somewhat enlarged and a few more letters are added, with a short specimen of her childish stories. The cancelled chapter of persuasion is given, in compliance with wishes both publicly and privately expressed. A fragment of a story entitled The Watsons is printed, and extracts are given from a novel which she had begun a few months before her death. But the chief edition is a short tale never before published called Lady Susan. I regret that the little which I have been able to add cannot appear in my first edition, as much of it was either unknown to me or not my command when I first published, and I hope that I may claim some indulgent allowance for the difficulty of recovering little facts and feelings which had been merged half a century deep in oblivion. November seventeenth, 1870 Chapter 1 Jane Austen was born on December sixteenth, 1775, at the Parsonage House of Steventon in Hampshire. Her father, the Reverend George Austen, was of a family long established in the neighborhood of Tenterden and Seven Oaks in Kent. I believe that early in the seventeenth century they were clothiers. Hasted, in his history of Kent, says, quote, The clothing business was exercised by persons who possessed most of the landed property in the Weald, and so much that almost all of the ancient families of these parts, now of large estates and genteel rank in life, and some of them ennobled by titles, are sprung from ancestors who have used this great staple manufacture, now almost unknown here." End quote. In his list of families, Hasted places the Austins, and he adds that these clothiers were usually called the Grey Coats of Kent, and were a body so numerous and united that at county elections, whoever had their vote and interest was almost certain of being elected. The family still retains a badge of this origin, for their livery is of that peculiar mixture of light blue and white called Kentish Grey which forms the facings of the Kentish militia. Mr. George Austin had lost both his parents before he was nine years old. He inherited no property from them, but was happy in having a kind uncle, Mr. Francis Austin, a successful lawyer at Tunbridge, the ancestor of the Austins of Kippington, who, though he had children of his own, yet made liberal provision for his orphan nephew. The boy received a good education at Tunbridge School, where he obtained a scholarship and subsequently a fellowship, at St. John's College, Oxford. In 1764 he came into possession of the two adjoining rectories of Dean and Steventon in Hampshire, the former purchased for him by his generous uncle Francis, the latter given by his cousin Mr. Knight. This was no very gross case of plurality. According to the ideas of that time, for the two villages were little more than a mile apart, and their united population scarcely amounted to three hundred. In the same year he married Cassandra, the youngest daughter of the Reverend Thomas Lee, of the family of Lees of Warwickshire, who, having been a fellow of all souls, held the college living of Harpston, near Henley-upon-Thames. Mr. Thomas Lee was the younger brother of Dr. Theophilus Lee, a personage well known at Oxford in his day, and his day was not a short one, for he lived to be ninety and held the mastership of Belial College for above half a century. He was a man more famous for his sayings than his doings, overflowing with puns and witticisms and sharp retorts. But his most serious joke was his practical one of living much longer than had been expected or intended. He was a fellow of Corpus, and the story is that the Balliol men, unable to agree in electing one of their own number to the mastership, chose him, partly under the idea that he was in weak health and likely soon to cause another vacancy. It was afterwards said that his long incumbency had been a judgment on the society for having elected an out-college man. I imagine that the front of Balliol towards Broad Street, which had recently been pulled down, must have been built, or at least restored, while he was master, for the Lee arms were placed under the cornice at the corner nearest to Trinity Gates. 
The beautiful building lately erected has destroyed this record, and thus monuments themselves memorials need. His fame for witty and agreeable conversation extended beyond the bounds of the university. Mrs. Thrale, in a letter to Dr. Johnson, writes thus, quote, Are you acquainted with Dr. Lee, the master of Balliol College, and are you not delighted with his gaiety of manners and youthful vivacity, now that he is eighty-six years of age? I never heard a more perfect or excellent pun than his, when some one told him how, in a late dispute among the privy councillors, the Lord Chancellor struck the table with such violence that he split it. No, 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 replied the master. I can hardly persuade myself that he split the table, though I believe he divided the board. Some of his sayings, of course, survive in family tradition. He was once calling on a gentleman notorious for never opening a book, who took him into a room overlooking the Bath Road, which was then a great thoroughfare for travellers of every class, saying rather pompously, This, doctor, I call my study. The doctor, glancing his eye around the room in which no books were to be seen, replied, And very well named, too, sir, for you know Pope tells us, the proper study of mankind is man. When my father went to Oxford he was honoured with an invitation to dine with this dignified cousin. Being a raw undergraduate, unaccustomed to the habits of the university, he was about to take off his gown as if it were a great coat when the old man, then considerably turned eighty, said, with a grim smile, "'Young man, you need not strip. We are not going to fight.' This humour remained in him so strongly to the last that he might almost have supplied Pope with another instance of the ruling passion strong in death. For only three days before he expired, being told that an old acquaintance was lately married, having recovered from a long illness by eating eggs, and that the wit said that had been egged on to matrimony, he immediately trumped the joke, saying, They made the yoke sit easy on him. I do not know from what common ancestor the master of Balliol and his great niece Jane Austen, with some others of the family, may have derived the keen sense of humour which they certainly possessed. Mr. and Mrs. George Austen resided first at Dean, but removed in 1771 to Steventon, which was their residence for about thirty years. They commenced their married life with the charge of a little child, a son of the celebrated Warren Hastings, who had been committed to the care of Mr. Austen before his marriage, probably through the influence of his sister Mrs. Hancock, whose husband at that time held some office under Hastings in India. Mr. Gleig, in his Life of Hastings, says that his son George, the offspring of his first marriage, was sent to England in 1761 for his education, but that he had never been able to ascertain to whom his precious charge was entrusted, nor what became of him. I am able to state from family tradition that he died young of what was then called putrid sore throat, and that Mrs. Austen had become so much attached to him that she always declared that his death had been as great a grief to her as if he had been a child of her own. About this time the grandfather of Mary Russell Mitford, Dr. Russell, was rector of the adjoining parish of Ash, so that the parents of two popular female writers must have been intimately acquainted with each other. As my subject carries me back about a hundred years, it will afford occasions for observing many changes gradually effected in the manners and habits of society, which I may think it worth while to mention. They may be little things, but time gives a certain importance even to trifles, as it imparts a peculiar flavor to wine. The most ordinary article of domestic life are looked on with some interest, if they are brought to light after being long buried, and we feel a natural curiosity to know what was done and said by our forefathers, even though it may be nothing wiser or better than what we are daily doing or saying ourselves. Some of this generation may be little aware how many conveniences, now considered to be necessities and matters of course, were unknown to their grandfathers and grandmothers. The lane between Dean and Steventon has long been as smooth as the best turnpike road, but when the family removed from the one residence to the other in 1771, it was a mere cart track, so cut up by deep ruts as to be impassable for a light carriage. Mrs. Austin, who was not then in strong health, performed the long journey on a feather bed, placed upon some soft articles of furniture in the wagon which held their household goods. In those days it was not unusual to set men to work with shovel and pickaxe to fill up the ruts and holes in roads seldom used by carriages, on such special occasions as a funeral or a wedding. Ignorance and coarseness of language also were still lingering, even upon higher levels of society than might have been expected to retain such mists. 
About this time a neighboring squire, a man of many acres, referred the following difficulty to Mr. Austin's decision. Quote, you know all of these sorts of things. Do tell us, is Paris in France or France in Paris? For my wife has been disputing with me about it. End quote. The same gentleman, narrating some conversation which he had heard between the rector and his wife, represented the latter as being her reply to her husband with a round oath, and when his daughter called him to task, reminding him that Mrs. Austin never swore, he replied, "'Now, Betty, why do you pull me up for nothing? That's neither here nor there. You know very well that's only my way of telling the story.'" Attention has lately been called by a celebrated writer to the inferiority of the clergy to the laity of England two centuries ago. The charge no doubt is true if the rural clergy are to be compared with that higher section of country gentlemen who went to, into Parliament and mixed in London society and took the lead in their several counties. But it might be found less true if they were to be compared, as in all fairness they ought to be, with that lower section with whom they usually associated. The smaller landed proprietors, who seldom went farther from their home than their county town, from the squire with his thousand acres to the yeoman who cultivated his hereditary property of one or two hundred, then formed a numerous class, each of the aristocrat of his own parish, and there was probably a greater difference in manner and refinement between this class and that immediately above them than can now be found between any two persons who rank as gentlemen. For in the progress of civilization, though all orders may make some progress, yet it is most perceptible in the lower. It is a process of leveling up, the rear rank, dressing up, as it were, close to the front rank. When Hamlet mentions as something which he had for three years taken note of, that the toe of the peasant comes so near the heel of the courtier, it is probably intended by Shakespeare as a satire on his own times but it expressed a principle which is working at all times in which society makes any progress. I believe that a century ago the improvement in most county parishes began with the clergy, and in those days a rector who chanced to be a gentleman and a scholar found himself superior to his chief parishioners in information and manners, and became a sort of center of refinement and politeness. Mr. Austin was a remarkably good-looking man, both in his youth and his old age. During his life of office at Oxford he had been called the handsome proctor, and at Bath, when more than seventy years old, he attracted observations by his fine features and abundance of snow-white hair. Being a good scholar, he was able to prepare two of his sons for the university, and to direct the studies of his other children, whether sons or daughters, as well as to increase his income by taking pupils. In Mrs. Austin also was to be found the germ of much of the ability which was concentrated in Jane but of which others of her children had a share. She united strong common sense with a lively imagination and often expressed herself, both in writing and in conversation, with epigrammatic force and point. She lived like many of her family to an advanced age. During the last years of her life she endured continual pain, not only patiently but with characteristic cheerfulness. She once said to me, quote, "'Ah, oh, my dear, you find me just where you left me, on the sofa.' I sometimes think that God Almighty must have forgotten me, but I dare say he will come for me in his own good time. End quote. She died and was buried at Chawton, january eighteen twenty seven, aged eighty eight. Her own family were so much and the rest of the world so little to Jane Austen that some brief mention of her brothers and sisters is necessary in order to give any idea of the objects which principally occupied her thoughts and filled her heart especially as some of them, from their characters or professions in life, may be supposed to have had more or less influence on her writings, though I feel some reluctance in bringing before public notice persons and circumstances essentially private. Her eldest brother, James, my own father, had, when a very young man at St. John's College, Oxford, been the originator and chief supporter of a periodical paper called The Loiterer, written somewhat on the plan of the spectator and its successors, but nearly confined to subjects connected with the university. In after life he used to speak very slightingly of his early work, which he had the better right to do, as whatever may have been the degree of their merits, the best papers had certainly been written by himself. He was well read in English literature, had a correct taste, and wrote readily and happily, both in prose and verse.' 
He was more than ten years older than Jane, and had, I believe, a large share in directing her reading and forming her taste. Her second brother, Edward, had been a good deal separated from the rest of the family, as he was early adopted by his cousin Mr. Knight, of Godmersham Park in Kent and Chawton House in Hampshire, and finally came into possession both of the property and the name. But though a good deal separated in childhood, they were much together in after life, and Jane gave a large share of her affections to him and his children. Mr. Knight was not only a very amiable man, kind and indulgent to all connected with him, but possessed also a spirit of fun and liveliness, which made him especially delightful to all young people. Her third brother, Henry, had great conversational powers, and inherited from his father an eager and sanguine disposition. He was a very entertaining companion, but had perhaps less steadiness of purpose, certainly less success in life than his brother's. He became a clergyman when middle-aged, and an allusion to his sermons will be found in one of Jane's letters. At one time he resided in London, and was useful in transacting his sister's business with her publishers. Her two youngest brothers, Francis and Charles, were sailors during that glorious period of the British Navy which comprises the close of the last and the beginning of the present century, when it was impossible for an officer to be almost always afloat, as these brothers were, without seeing service which, in these days, would be considered distinguished. Accordingly, they were continually engaged in actions of more or less importance, and sometimes gained promotion by their success. Both rose to the rank of admiral, and carried out their flags to distant stations. Francis lived to attain the very summit of his professional, having lived in his ninety-third year, G.C.B., and senior admiral of the fleet in 1865. He possessed great firmness of character with a strong sense of duty, whether due from himself to others, or from others to himself. He was consequently a strict disciplinarian, but as he was a very religious man, it was remarked of him, for in those days at least it was remarkable, that he maintained this discipline without ever uttering an oath or permitting one in his presence. On one occasion, when ashore in a seaside town, he was spoken of as the officer who kneeled at church, a custom which now happily would not be thought peculiar. Charles was generally serving in frigates or sloops, blockading harbors, driving the ships of the enemy ashore, boarding gunboats, and frequently making small prizes. At one time he was absent from England on such services for seven years together. In later life he commanded the Belle Orofin at the bombardment of St. Jean d'Acre in 1840. In 1850 he went out in the Hastings in command of the East India and China Station, but on the breaking out of the Burmese War he transferred his flag to a steam sloop for the purpose of getting up the shallow waters of the Irrawaddy, on board of which he died of cholera in 1852, in the seventy-fourth year of his age. His sweet temper and affectionate disposition, in which he resembled his sister Jane, has secured him an unusual portion of attachment, not only from his own family, but from all the officers and common sailors who served under him. One who was with him at his death has left this record of him. Our good admiral won the hearts of all by his gentleness and kindness until he was struggling with disease, and endeavoring to do his duty as commander-in-chief of the British naval forces in these waters. His death was a great grief to the whole fleet. I know that I cried bitterly when I found he was dead. The order and counsel of the Governor-General of India, Lord Dalhousie, expresses admiration of the staunch high spirit which, notwithstanding his age and previous sufferings, had led the admiral to take his part in the trying service which has closed his career. These two brothers have been dwelt on longer than the others because their honorable career accounts for Jane Austen's partiality for the Navy, as well as for the readiness and accuracy with which she wrote about it. She was always very careful not to meddle with matters which she did not thoroughly understand. She never touched upon politics, law, or medicine, subjects which some novel writers have ventured on rather too boldly, and have treated, perhaps, with more brilliancy than accuracy. But with ships and sailors she felt herself at home, or at least could always trust to a brotherly critic to keep her right. I believe that no flaw has ever been found in her seamanship, either in Mansfield Park or in Persuasion. But dearest of all to the heart of Jane was her sister Cassandra, about three years her senior. Their sisterly affection for each other could scarcely be exceeded. Perhaps it began on Jane's side with the feeling of deference natural to a loving child towards a kind elder sister. Something of this feeling always remained, and even in the maturity of her powers and in the enjoyment of increasing success, she would still speak of Cassandra as of one wiser and better than herself. 
In childhood, when the elder was sent to the school of Mrs. Laternal in the Forbury at Reading, the younger went with her, not because she was thought old enough to profit much by the instruction there imparted, but because she would have been miserable without her sister, her mother observing that, if Cassandra were going to have her head cut off, Jane would insist on sharing her fate. This attachment was never interrupted or weakened. They lived in the same house and shared the same bedroom till separated by death. They were not exactly alike. Cassandra's was the colder and calmer disposition. She was always prudent and well-judging, but with less outward demonstration of feeling and less sunniness of temper than Jane possessed. It was remarked in her family that Cassandra had the merit of having her temper always under command, but that Jane had the happiness of a temper that never required to be commanded. When sense and sensibility came out, some persons who knew the family slightly surmised that the two elder Miss Dashwoods were intended by the author for her sister and herself, but this could not be the case. Cassandra's character might indeed represent the sense of Eleanor, but Jane's had little in common with the sensibility of Marianne. The young woman, who, before the age of twenty, could so clearly discern the failings of Marianne Dashwood, could hardly have been subject to them herself. This was the small circle, continually enlarged, however, by the increasing families of four of her brothers, within which Jane Austen found her wholesome pleasures, duties, and interests, and beyond which she went very little into society during the last ten years of her life. There was so much that was agreeable and attractive in this party that its members may be excused if they were inclined to live somewhat too exclusively within it. They might see in each other much to love and esteem and something to admire. The family talk had abundance of spirit and vivacity, and was never troubled by disagreements even in little matters, for it was not their habit to dispute or argue with each other. Above all, there was strong family affection and firm union, never to be broken but by death. It cannot be doubted that all this had its influence on the author in the construction of her stories, in which a family party usually supplies the narrow stage, while the interest is made to revolve around a few actors. It will be seen also that though her circle of society was small, yet she found in her neighborhood persons of good taste and cultivated minds. Her acquaintance, in fact, constituted the very class from which she took her imaginary characters, ranging from the member of parliament or large landed proprietor to the young curate or younger midshipman of equally good family. And I think the influence of these early associations may be traced in her writings, especially in two particulars. First, that she was entirely free from the vulgarity, which is so offensive in some novels, of dwelling on the outward appendages of wealth or rank, as if they were things to which the writer was unaccustomed. Secondly, that she deals as little with very low as with very high stations in life. She does not go lower than the Miss Steeles, Mrs. Elton, and John Thorpe, people of bad taste and underbred manners, such as are actually found sometimes mingling with better society. She has nothing resembling the Bringtons or Mr. Dubster and his friend Tom Hicks, with whom Madame de Arblay left to season her stories and to produce striking contrast to her well-bred characters. End of chapter 1 Recording by Laurie Heinrichs